Okay, so let's continue with the next lesson in this course, which is about uh, talking about what is the, the role of the software architect and what what are stakeholders. Uh, as you know, in Arc 42, in the templates, there is a place where you can fill what are the stakeholders, and maybe you don't know what what how to identify the stakeholders and what are the stakeholders. And also, I mean, so this is uh, uh, talking about software architect and stakeholders. This uh, lesson is about the people who are involved in a software architecture project. OK, so this is the talking about the, the people. The people are the software architect itself, but also the stakeholders. So that's what we are going to talk. So uh, the role of a software architect, the first thing I want to talk is the expectations of an architect. So what are uh, what we think should be a good architect. So so we are going to have an overview of, of all these things. OK, OK, so the next slides will be about uh, how to make architectural decisions, uh, analyze the architecture. So those are the things that uh, a software architect has to, to do. And I want to say also that in, there is a principle that I I like and, and there is a trend now in a lot of companies is that uh, the software architect is not so much a rank. I mean, a rank is something that uh, you are the software architect in the company and you have that uh, title and everybody uh, do, does what you do because uh, I mean, everybody understands that, that you are the software architect. Nowadays, in a lot of companies, that's no longer true and it depends Depending on how you divide the teams, the the architect it is some role that sometimes is even rotating. So some someone in, if there is a team, for example, of five people, there is someone that takes the role of software architect at some uh, point in time, but later they change and there is another one in the same team that takes that role. Okay, so that that sounds interesting because. For me, it's more like the role. So, so in some companies, there is someone who has to take the decisions and to to understand what is the big picture, and it's not always the same people, the same one. Okay, so let's uh, take this overview. Uh, first, uh, the first thing is to make architectural decisions. So the software architect is the usually. I mean, if you are uh, how to say a, a good software architect those decisions uh, are made by you but with some kind of consensus with the team okay but in the responsible people for those decisions is the software architect or the role of the software architect is the the one who has to to defend those decisions and uh, has to to talk to the other people uh, what were the decisions that have been made so uh, it is very important to understand uh, how to take decisions and this is also a very a difficult topic. I mean, probably this is something that you will never learn and you will be all your life learning how to take decisions because it's not, I mean, nobody has, I mean, if we knew how to take decisions in all our life, we would be always happy and all that, but that's not true. I mean, you, you can do wrong decisions and, and you have to understand the how to to manage with those decisions and when you do a wrong decisions how to change and then later uh, take another decision it is very important i will I, so this year i added several slides uh, about decision records and you know in the seminars there is going to be some some work about uh, keeping architectural decision records because i think it is more and more uh, in, understood by the community of software architecture that decision records are very important. OK, so you have to analyze what are the pros and the cons of the different decisions. Then the next thing is that uh, the software architect has to continually, and this is important, so you have to continually analyze the architecture to take into account if the if the software that is being developed is following the architecture that you defined and uh, if there is any 
any any problem you have to to take another decision and you have to to be aware of what i call here the structural decay so sometimes i mean imagine you you do some very nice diagrams and the beginning of the project but then later you see that the, i mean for example you you think that there will be two modules but later you see that the resulting uh, system has uh, not two modules but maybe three modules and they are communicating in this way so you have to understand that and maybe you have to update the, the documentation so to keep consistency between the con 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 documentation and the, the developed software this is also important and this is something that we are going to ask you later in the lab assignment to synchronize what you implement in the prototype with what uh, with what uh, you have in the documentation, okay? And this is important to organize the code in packages folders, so you can understand. You can, looking at the code, you can understand what is the structure of the system and the architecture, and define boundaries and some principles that you want to follow, and also include some kind of testing um, about the projects and environments, etc. Okay. Uh, also. As I said, you have to ensure that there is some kind of compliance uh, with the system decisions. So sometimes you take the decision, but later people don't <laughs> follow that decision. And that's something that usually happens. And because I mean, we are people and we uh, make mistakes and all that. For example, you you can say, okay, let's have a model view controller, and we, we have this kind of uh, diff. Uh, uh, I mean, layer architecture where you have the user interface which communicates with the business logic and then later the database. But maybe some developer just does a direct call from the user interface to the database. That's wrong and that's uh, something they are bypassing your decision and you have to be aware of these kind of things to, to say, okay, this is not uh, okay and we should add some class here in the business logic to go in this direction, okay, because those are some constraints at the end the software architect something which is important that he has to do is to to contain what is called the entropy of the system so you I mean the, the if you let anybody da, do whatever he wants the system will have no modules and we have maybe just a very big uh, uh, file with all the the code in that file and that's usually wrong because it's very difficult to maintain a good software architect must be also keep current with existing trends. So he has to be aware of the latest technology and the different uh, trends in the industry um, because when he takes a decision, he has to defend that. Um, maybe I mean, imagine that you say, I want to develop this uh, thing, but I want to develop it in Java. But later you understand, uh, you, you see that there is a framework, uh, maybe in Elixir, that is a different programming language that does the same thing, but much, much easier than you using plain Java. So you have to, to understand what are the trends in the industry. So you have to to so you have to 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 be aware of those uh, trends because at the end it is like in traditional buildings. In the traditional buildings you can see that the buildings that we uh, create today are completely different from the buildings that were created uh, 50 years ago. Okay. So this is important um, also, I mean, you have to be aware of this mindset, the mindset that you have to, I mean, it's important that, that you know what are the things that you know. I mean, this, you, you already know that, but this is a small thing because the, the knowledge is very big. Um, but it is important that you also know what you don't know. So, for example, I have been now talking about Elixir. Does anyone know about Elixir? Maybe you didn't even know that it existed, because probably, I mean, I'm not sure. So that's a programming language uh, that uh, is quite trendy nowadays, and maybe you, you don't know, but the important is that you know that you don't know about Elixir. So you know that there, there is another framework uh, called uh, Phoenix that is made in Elixir, and it's very trendy, and you know that it exists, and you are not going to use that, but at least you know that you don't know that framework. And so th something that a good software architect has to do is to to move the, the things that you don't know that you don't know. I mean, there are, for example, Elixir, maybe you didn't know that it existed. And so there are a lot of things that are going to be here. And you have to move those things to the things that you know that you don't know. 
Okay, so this is a bit uh, uh, tricky to do, but I think it's interesting to have this mindset. So the mindset is that you have to move from things that you didn't even know that they existed. You have to put those things in things that you know that they exist, but maybe you are not an expert, but at least you know that they exist. Okay, so this is important. Uh, also, it's important to have some kind of uh, exposure to uh, an experience and to, to be exposed to different uh, projects. So, I mean, the software industry, there is a lot of uh, certifications that you, mm, I think they are, they are interesting. Uh, and at the end, in some companies, for example, if you are a DBA, they, you have Oracle uh, certifications and you have or other certifications at the end. All those certificates and all those uh, all the things that you learn uh, will be good because uh, at least you, for example, if someone asks you to to develop something uh, in, a, in a database, at least it's good that you know about uh, some uh, NoSQL uh, database, for example, MongoDB or or other. There are a lot of other databases, uh, and you know uh, some relational database. So it's very, in in principle, for a software architect. I mean, it, it depends that you, about your, uh, your your plans for the future. But if you are planning to be a, a, a software architect, usually it's better to have a technical breadth so you have you know more things uh, that exist better than a technical depth that you know something very 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 deep so some, sometimes i mean this is useful in in some aspects but not for software architects because i mean if you are going to be a software architect architect you have to defend your decisions and you have to understand what are the other alternatives so at least you know you need to know what are the, those altern alternatives okay of course, you also need to have some kind of uh, knowledge about the business domain, and this is something that usually I, my experience is that people who are in this degree, that they are computer scientists, and they usually don't like very much the business thing. So if you you have, a, but that's very important. And by business, when I talk here, business domain. I'm not just specifically talking about business as we understand it in uh, about monetary things or, or or this kind of things because the business domain, for example, if you are going to to work, for example, for a healthcare uh, company, the business domain are is uh, health health infrastructure. So is is something about uh, health domain, but also, for example, here in Asturias we have uh, ArcelorMittal. It's a company where you they are providing steel. So maybe the, the business domain for you is going to be related with uh, steel, steel development and, and all those kind of things. So when I talk about the business domain is the domain about the, the uh, in which you are working. So if you go to a bank, that that is specifically business because that's uh, money. But if you go for the health sector, that would be about health. Or if you go to, to for example, the European Space Agency, maybe those are things about uh, the space and all that. Okay, so that's that's what I'm talking. And um, very important, and that's something that uh, this year I will I added several slides about this, about how to to have some kind of uh, interpersonal skills. At the end, the software architect is usually considered like the leader of the team. So you will be considered. So there is a team, and you will be the one to take that takes the decisions. So it's as I said, in I think the other day, it's like the coach in a in a soccer team. Uh, the the coach is like the software architect is the one that takes those decisions. So it is important that you. Be care, be careful with your uh, how to work in a team and which are your leadership skills. And if you want to become a good software architect, you have to to be careful with these kind of things. And I know that it, this is usually difficult because, especially in this, I mean, the people who who came here to study computer science, usually you came here because you were attracted more by by technical things and not so much by uh, interpersonal skills some people i mean people who like more interpersonal skills usually take other degrees for example psychology other things and usually don't go don't come here to computer science but uh, i have to say that uh, if you want 
to have some progress in your career, at the end you have to, to learn about the interpersonal skills. Uh, so you have to be inclusive uh, and collaborate with other people. You have to de help developers understand the big picture. So you, you have to, in some way, it's like you have to, to be a teacher. You, you have to teach other people. And sometimes you also have to, 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 to hands on, so you, you have to be engaged in the delivery of the system, uh, have some kind of understanding of the low level things i like very much software architects when they code and, and they participate in the in the development so they are able to to code and also sometimes i mean software architects usually have are very busy people so they probably don't, don't have enough time to to be coding all the details but at least they participate in code reviews um some kind of mentorship to to young people so this is also very important and at the end as i said here uh, this is i mean I, I this is not me who said this but at the end, most of the problems, and uh, now that I am becoming old, you know, I have participated in several com uh, uh, projects, as is what I say here, no matter what they tell you, it's always, always, usually always a human problem, a problem of the people who are involved. I mean, the technical problems usually are quite easy to, uh, to solve, I mean, usually, compared with uh, human problems. And at the end, maybe there is someone in the team that is not working, or maybe the, 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 the manager uh, is doing something wrong. So usually people problems are the most difficult to handle and to, to solve, okay? And finally, in this uh, things that a good software architect has to understand is that at the end, you, it's very important that you understand the political climate of the enterprise and by this I mean not political in the sense of po uh, politics but uh, in the sense of uh, the company I mean in the company there will be some uh, CEO which is the the, the the person who takes the the bigger decisions in the enterprise or the company there will be developers and usually a good software architect has to communicate with all those people so there will be people in marketing um, and, I mean there's a lot of people involved and you have to talk with all of them and you have to understand that so the, also having some kind of negotiation skills is usually required to, to to have as i said to present and defend architecture and this is i mean there is a very nice book uh, from this year which is called the software architects elevator i really recommend this book software architects elevator because it is it has a lot of uh, a wisdom from someone who really understands the the in, intricacies of uh, companies. Um, uh, the metaphor of this book is that the software architects are the ones who who take the elevator and go from the uh, higher levels of the company to the low levels of the company and the low levels could be for example the the developers and the the team who are developing here and in the basement to here to the business people who take the bigger decisions so you have to take this elevator and go from one place to the other and to be able to communicate with all those people okay so uh, the main concerns of software architects, uh, something that we are going to talk a lot in the rest of the course, is this. Uh, you have to specify quality attributes. Uh, I will talk later more about quality attributes. We have a whole lesson uh, devoted to quality attributes, so which is uh, how to do something. It's not uh, what you have to do, but how you have to do that. For example, how by that, by how I mean, uh, it has to be scalable. It has to be uh, maintainable. Those kind of things. And probably, it's not that you, uh, to understand only what you have to do, which are the functional requirements, but uh, how and how are the non-functional requirements or the quality attributes. You also have to understand the trade-offs. I already said about this, and you have to take decisions. So this is uh, why you are doing something. In the why are the decisions and as i said before you have to contain the entropy so you have to define the standards conventions uh, tool sets etc for the teams okay and now these are the these slides are new for this year i added because i think this is something that i was missing in this course because uh, i was not 
teaching uh, people about this. And it's very difficult for me as a teacher to to try to teach this because sometimes I, I am the first one who is not able to to work in, in well with a team. But at least I want you to, to be aware that it is very, very important to be able to work in a team if you want to be a good software architect. So this is what I say here. So software engineering is a team endeavor. It's something that you will have to work in, in team. So you have to take care of social interactions and to understand this kind of thing. So the, what is the, the right team size? What is the right way to the, the topology of the team? Uh, and what are the different personalities that you could have as a software architect and to have this balance? OK, so let's so the the next slide I'm going to review all of this. Um, and this, I mean, most of this can come from several books, and this one comes from also an, a new book from this year, which is uh, Software Engineering at Google. And I am reading the book right now, and I, I mean, there is a chapter specifically, one of the first chapters is about uh, uh, working in teams. Um, they say this, I mean, sometimes, people, the, especially young people, uh, have a lot of insecurity. Um, if they are very insecure, they want, for example, to hide uh, what they are developing and they want to present things which are very, uh, which are finished and they are very good things and, and that's understandable. Um, so sometimes people are afraid of other people that they are judging their work in progress. So they attempt, for example, to hide codes. And this is something that I already I saw this a lot of times in the course. Uh, as you can, as you know, in this course, we are working with uh, GitHub repositories and with open GitHub repositories. They are they are public. They are not private. Um, that's something that I I do on purpose because I don't want you to hide your code. And this is something that you have to learn you have to be proud of your code and sometimes you if you are not proud don't worry because you have to improve that and you have to learn that you, this is just a work in progress so please don't hide your code try to 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 be more secure of yourself um, and i think that because the idea of this course is that all you and me under, uh, learn new things and understand and I want you to create nice things. So so this is something that please, uh, as I said here, uh, hiding is considered harmful. So please don't hide the things. Uh, just for example, another uh, symptom is when you don't ask questions in the public and a lot of you already some of you already asked me something as private emails and I, I said at the beginning of the course that I prefer that you post your questions in the public forum of the course. I mean, there is a forum in the virtual, campus virtual, but not only there, you can also ask questions, for example, in the Stack Overflow, and you can ask questions in other places. And also, for example, uh, try not to work alone. I know that this year, I mean, you are not uh, we are not working face to face. We are working remotely, but try to, for example, when you do something, to publish that in the GitHub repository to create a issue. So that's very, very important because working alone increases the risk. And this is very important that you understand that. And I, what I talk here about the genius myth is that some people uh, think, especially young people, usually uh, what I say, they ascribe the success of a team to a single person. So some people say, oh, Bill Gates, Bill Gates is a genius, or Linux Torvalds, they are genius and they developed uh, Linux or they developed uh, uh, Microsoft uh, operating systems. And that's wrong because they, and that's their name and their name appears there, but for example, the Linux system was developed by a team. Uh, it's, uh, the same of the Microsoft uh, operating system. So all those, um, I mean, most of the projects uh, in the industry have hasn't been done by a genius myth. I mean, there is no, I mean, it's very difficult to, to think about a software project that has been done by a single person. And that's a myth and you have to understand that. So at the end, it's very important that you work in a team, okay? The other thing, I see, this is a bit funny, is the what I call the, the bus factor. And this, this also comes from this book. So this is the software engineering at Google. It's a very 
new book. And they, they say that in, in Google, they have this uh, bus factor. And I mean, I, this is a nice picture here. And this is the, uh, the number of people that need to get hit by a bus before your project is completely dumped and you, you have a failure in the project. Um, the thing is that you have a lot of unpredictable life events that can happen. For example, someone can break his leg. I mean, it's not necessary that you are hit by a bus, but you could, for example, break a leg or you can just have a, you can get sick or you can get married or what, whatever. So there is a lot of unpredictable life events and some people can leave uh, the team and you have to, the bus factor is, I, what happens if some of those guys leave the the project and what happens with your project and this is important for example for this year for your lab assignment uh, when you develop something that I, I i know because in the past years several teams what they do is that they divide the team the the work and they say okay this guy is going to do this thing this other guy is going to do uh, another thing so they have what well, they it's called a team assignments and this guy is going to be but this other part of the project and only one single guy is going to do uh, the different parts okay so this guy is going to do this part what happens if this guy fails if this guy fails all the project fails and that's an anti-pattern that's also something which is it can happen but uh, try not to, to fail in that anti-pattern because at the end if someone fails with a critical module all the team is going to fail Okay, so be careful with that. Uh, in principle, for example, I would advise you that to have at least two people in any important task of your project. So you have a backup one that can solve uh, the problem if something fails. And also to have good documentation. This is very important that if you are working, uh, try not to work alone. Also, if you create something, try to, do, to document that. So later someone else can uh, take that, uh, that thing, okay? And if you are working in uh, and you have social interactions, I mean, this is probably something which is very obvious. Uh, and probably you will say, OK, I, I am like these guys. But uh, for example, in software engineering at Google, they, they explicitly mention that because a lot of engineers usually fail in some of these uh, aspects. For example, you have to be human, hum you have to have humility and you are not the center of the universe uh, and your code isn't the center of the universe you have to be open to self-improvement um, you have to, to understand that you are not infallible so you can have failures and mistakes and, and problems and that's not a problem please if you do some kind of problem just uh, put that in a issue in your project and and try to be to have humility and to to understand, I mean, we have you understand that everyone can make mistakes. Okay, every everyone. Okay, and also if you have this uh, mindset, you have to respect the work of other people. So you understand that other people can are not infallible; they can make mistakes. Um, so you have to to treat to treat them kindly and to appreciate their abilities and their accomplishments because. You have to, to respect other people and to take care of, of other people because maybe they have some problem. In, in this course, I know that, I mean, you are teams of five, six people, and sometimes one of the members of the team has a particular problem, maybe because he has, uh, he has uh, one pending uh, subject from past year, and he has a new uh, an exam, and in some weeks he, he will not be able to work. You have to understand that and you have to take care and to, to negotiate with him and say, OK, so this in this uh, deliverable, you are not going to work in this part, but in the next one, you are going to work more or whatever. And you have to, to, to be able to understand that. If, and also, finally, you have to you need to have some kind of trust in what your colleagues are going to do. So you have to believe in other people, uh, believe uh, that other people will do the right thing. Uh, in some years, I noticed that especially the people who are very skilled, they usually have problems to work in, to integrate in a team when people in the project are not so much skilled. So they don't, uh, sometimes they don't let other people to work um, that, and then they have later problems. So be careful with that, those kind of uh, patterns. Okay. 
So sometimes you have to delegate in other people, and if they fail, then you have to to create a issue, and then you have to 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 have some backup uh, uh, way to 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 understand that when the other people fail, you have to recover from that. Okay, but those are I mean th these three pillars of social interaction is not something that I have invented. They come from this book. And I think this is important that you know about this and you try always to 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 think if you follow and you, this kind of things. OK. Another aspect uh, about personalities of software architects, I mean, this is probably not something for this year for you because uh, you are not. I mean, there is no one people who is the software architect and the others are the, the developers, but uh, this also comes from several books and they talk about and so if you look in, if you search in Google, you will see that there is a term called a control freak and arm search uh, architect. And the idea is that you have to balance between both things. I mean, you shouldn't be this kind of a uh, control freak that you participate in all decisions uh, decisions which sometimes are too fine grained and very low level. And you even participate in code in all the code development or the most important parts of the project, because at the end you will be the bottleneck and that's also the that's a problem. But on the other side, you shouldn't go here and be just the one who only participate in the initial diagrams. So sometimes it happens and the software architect uh, in some big companies, uh, he just draws some UML diagrams and he jumps to another project and he forgets about the developers and etc. And that's also another anti-pattern because he's disconnected from the development teams. The, the team at the end may take another decisions and those diagrams will be forgotten um, so that's also another anti-pattern. So you have to, to find the effective architect is the one who is able to balance in this. Uh, so it's a middle between both. OK. Um, the next thing is about team topologies. Uh, I mean, at the end, this is important because uh, how you organize the, the team will affect the system. In this course, uh, the, the the team has already already created has been already created by the the teachers. But uh, when you go to a company, maybe you will be responsible to create the teams. Um, as I said here, I mean, not no, I, this guy Michael Nigard, uh, he said that team assignments probably are the first draft of the architecture. The first thing that you will probably do in some projects is to 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 look to your the people you have in your company and to assign modules or assign responsibilities to those, to those people. So you have to to be aware of what is the, the right team size and what is the the, the communication structures, etc. And you have to understand those things. And this is a, a typical example of what happens in some companies. In some companies, you have and they already have the teams. I mean, if you go to companies that, uh, for example, consultancies that they have been working in software development maybe 10 years. So they they usually, for example, this is a very typical example. They have a team of front end developers, which are the user uh, user interaction and all that. So they learn a lot about uh, uh, how to create a very good software for front end. They also have the back end developers. For example, for example, uh, this could be HTML, CSS, JavaScript. This one could be Java uh, or Python or the or business logic here. And then they also have uh, people from DBA. Those are the, 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 the another team, which are the, the database administrators. And uh, so they handle Oracle, MongoDB, et cetera, et cetera. And they also have another team from operations. So these are the teams who are uh, responsible to take the code that has been developed and put that to run. And uh, so they are people who know a lot about uh, uh, system administration, Unix, uh, Linux, uh, et cetera. So, so they have these four teams. If they have these four teams, sometimes the architecture of the applications will be decomposed in this way. So they have the uh, the presentation layer, the business uh, logic uh, layer, the database layer, the persistence layer, and the operations. And they divide the architecture in this way. So that's a very typical uh, thing that happened. Um, Sometimes this is good, but something which is quite trendy nowadays is that there was, oh, and, and this is wrong, sorry for that. 
because I noticed this is Conway, not Conway. So, sorry. And then I, maybe I copy past it. So this is uh, called the Conway's law. The Conway's law is, uh, and this is a very nice law because it was, um, it was described in 1967, a long time ago, by, and by Melvin Conway, and he said, organizations which design systems usually are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of those organizations. And this is what I said before. I mean, when you have uh, these four teams, your architectures, uh, your systems will usually be divided in these four aspects. And sometimes that's uh, that's OK, but sometimes uh, maybe it's not OK. And you have other the structures in mind. Um, and this is what I have. So usually if you have three teams, then the system will naturally have these three modules. And um, as I said, in some nowadays, uh, people are talking about microservices and they are trying to to divide the systems in a different way and this is the necessary i mean so this is something which is called the inverse conway maneuver which is you first organize the modules you say you say okay i will have for example imagine you, i have a, a project and i divide the project in this uh, this uh, four microservices here. So this in this example, I have in this example, I have uh, one microservice uh, A, another microservice B, etc. And these are the four microservices because maybe this is a. Uh, I mean, I have a. Uh, this is for example for uh, product the uh, for. Uh, I mean. I'm trying to find a good example here, but imagine you have an example where you have uh, these are the people uh, facing uh, the catalog of products. These are the people who are uh, looking for the providers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you have different microservices. They have to communicate between them, but you have different parts of the. I mean, you have this microservices are independent from other microservices. I will talk later more in the course about what is the microservices architecture, but you divide the system in these four modules. And once you created the modules, then you assign a team and you create a team A, which will be in charge of this microservice, a team B will be in charge of this other microservice, a team C in charge of microservice C and so on. OK, so the idea is that you evolve the teams and the organizational structure to promote the desired architecture. So this means that you create the architecture the four modules and once you have those four modules you create teams that will try to work with those modules okay and there is a principle in amazon which is uh, uh, you build it and you run it so if you are the team who is developing uh, who is building microservice a, a this team is the one who is going to run microservice A. So for example, notice that here I didn't put a operations a team in the previous slide. We had here operations, uh, but nowadays a trend is that the, there is no operations teams uh, exclusively devoted to operations, but all of the developers have uh, some kind of knowledge about operations. This is called DevOps, and this is something maybe this is a word that maybe you will learn uh, uh, in other courses. I will also talk a little bit about DevOps later, but uh, this is structure is usually uh, hand in with hand with uh, DevOps. OK, and this is called the inverse Conway uh, maneuver. About team size, I mean, about team size, the efficient team size uh, usually can influence the, the success of the project. Um, there is this rule from Jeff Bezos in Amazon that uh, usually two pizzas is uh, if you 
can fit the, the thing with two pizzas is that's okay. And this means usually between five or seven people, five, eight, eight people, and no more than five or uh, and also no less. I mean, if you have a team with one or two people or three people, usually it's difficult because if one of them fails, then all the project can fail. So at least to have four or five people is uh, good. Uh, and some warnings I I found this one is interesting uh, about what happens when you have bigger teams. And um, also, I have to say some in some previous courses, uh, some people were asking me, I mean, but if we had, if we were a bigger team, we could develop more things in the project. Usually, that's not uh, that that's not something that happens in practice. And this is uh, also what is called a process loss. I, I like this term. And this is the difference between the potential of a group and the productivity of that group. Um, so this is the, the process loss. Uh, this, this is here. So what the potential, imagine you have three developers and you can say, okay, if, we, if these three developers can develop, uh, I mean, each of them can develop uh, 100 lines of code uh, per day, at the end, you could say, okay, so I should have uh, 300 lines per code. That's not a good uh, measure, but anyway, you could measure it in that way. But at the end, you can see that they don't produce dot. I mean, it's not the sum of the the potential of the each individual term doesn't have is not equal to the actual productivity because there is some loss uh, for the I mean the reason is for the process for example they have to communicate they have to organize and all that and you will notice I mean in for example in the, for the lab assignment of this year and this is something I already have seen in the past years sometimes teams which uh, lose some members or some teams that they i mean some year there was a team that uh, i mean one year there was one or two persons in a team because the other members didn't participate they just abandoned the course etc and um, sometimes one person was more productive and was able to end the the lab assignment better than teams that, for example, had uh, eight people. Because when you have eight people, they have to communicate, then they have a lot of uh, problems with the people. So this is something which is called the Brooks Law. And this comes from a book called The Mythical Man Month. And he said that adding more people to a project which is late doesn't uh, so usually doesn't make the project uh, uh, to to not to be late and usually makes the project later so usually because if you add more people what will happen is that those people go, come to the project they have to communicate to the other people at the end you you will have more process loss okay you understand that topic okay and this one is also very interesting and also something that happens in practice a lot uh, this is called a pluralistic ignorance. Pluralistic ignorance comes from this book. I mean, probably you, you all know this uh, fable of the emperor's new clothes. And this is when when the emperor goes uh, nude and everybody is looking to the emperor, saying, looking, and he says, but he's, he's nude, but nobody says anything because everybody thinks that there is something obvious that they are missing and and they everybody is is okay with that situation and this is something that happens in usually in big organizations in big organizations some decisions could be completely wrong um, but and nobody says anything nobody speaks up and say hey this is wrong because they think that there is something obvious that they are missing. So, and this is something that I said in big companies, uh, this is usually something that happens. So, so having a very big team, usually an, a, a, an architect that doesn't uh, uh, communicate very well, it could happen this uh, that uh, the whole team is going in the wrong direction, but nobody complains because they, it is a very big team. Okay, and related with this, there is another uh, thing called diffusion of responsibility, and this is something probably you know, is that if you also have a very big team, uh, the communication usually is not very good, and some signs are when you don't know who is going to be responsible. I don't know that there is there are some psychological experiments that some people, for example, in a big city uh, falls down 
and, and he fell down in a big city and in a small field. And usually if he is in a small field, a lot of people are going to, to help him. But if you are in a big city surrounded by a lot of people, nobody helps him. I don't know if you know about that, but it's something that that happens sometimes because uh, people think, okay, so the responsible is this guy, and this guy is going to the, okay, the responsible is this guy, or and at the end, some people can be in the street uh, and nobody looks for them. This in software, what happens is that uh, something similar, but uh, for example, for, with issues. Uh, sometimes uh, you have a issue and nobody takes care of that issue, and because you say, okay, this is the we are a big team and it's going to be solved by another member of the team. Be careful with that because sometimes uh, you have uh, some communication problems. Okay. Finally, there is uh, this is. I mean, I wanted to add this to, to these slides because uh, there is a, a book uh, talking about uh, how checklists are very effective uh, for for teams or for big teams. Um, this is, I mean, there was a study saying that uh, if you want uh, some tasks which are error prone to be done and not to be missed, uh, it's very good to you create a, a checklist. A checklist is, uh, I mean, if you go in, in the airplanes, for example, the pilots, the pilots, they have this kind of uh, checklist where they have to to put marks on all the things that they have they have been checking, and this is a way to make the team more uh, effective. So just uh, some the, the topic here, I not go to. I'm not going to go into more details here, but it is uh, having checklists is usually very effective for, for when you are a big team. And there is something called the Hawthorne effect, which is that if people know that they are being observed, usually they try to behave better than if they don't, they are not aware that someone is uh, checking this kind of list. Okay, so just having a checklist usually is very helpful. Okay, so that was about uh, the software architect role and how to work in teams. And now the next section is about uh, stakeholders. So now we are going to talk a bit about uh, stakeholders. Uh, stakeholders, uh, as I said before, it's very important that you identify what are the stakeholders. Um, and the stakeholders are all the people, all the the parties, the different parties that participate in the development of the system or are affected by the system. So usually, as I say here, they can be a single person or a role or an organization. So and they have different concerns. And something what what usually happens is that sometimes the concerns are contradictory. And this is happens a lot of times. I mean, if you have the more experience that you will have, the more anecdotes you could have about uh, projects where someone is saying that the most important thing is security, but you go to talk with other people and they say no, no. But the most important thing is scalability. And then you go to the business uh, uh, people and say no, no. We want this very fast. So the most important thing is time to market. So you have to, to provide it very fast to the market. So understanding the stakeholders is usually very, very important for the success of the project. Because as I said here, at the end, the interest of the stakeholders are what usually drive the shape and the direction of the architecture. So usually you have to be very careful understanding what are the, the different needs and of the different stakeholders. So it's necessary to understand the nature of the and the priority of the concerns uh, to engage with them. If you have stakeholders, you have to, to talk with them and to ask them the, what are their needs and what are the expectations they have about the, the software projects. Okay. So uh, identifying stakeholders is more an art that uh, that a science uh, is very important. It's not very easy. And what we want in this course is that 
you understand that this is important and that you try to do that. For example, in, in the ARC 42, there is a section uh, specifically to, to, to put which are the stakeholders. And as I said here before, they are all individuals, roles and organizations that know the architecture, that have, they have to be convinced about the architecture, have to, have to work with the code, uh, they need the documentation, the architectural documentation, and they can take decisions. So, Sometimes the stakeholders are the the the, the boss or in the company. There, there is a in the, the the CEO in the company. That's the, the person who takes decisions, and that's a very important the stakeholders. Usually more more important than the end user. Okay, and this is uh, a typical stakeholders. But as I put here uh, dots, it means it means that you could have much more stakeholders than this. So the list is. It could be infinite and you could have the internal develop i mean internal are members in your team or your company and external are members which are not in your team for example here you can have the the analyst the designer the i mean the analyst is the one who to takes the requirements the business manager the developer the, the product owner the auditor the user experience designer the project manager etc so you have a lot of uh, people who could be involved in the project, but you could also have external people, for example, the, the customer, the end user, the public authority, the suppliers, uh, the, the providers of external services, etc. For example, uh, one stakeholder which is important in your lab assignments, I think you already uh, know that, are the teachers. I mean, the, the teachers, we are external uh, stakeholders to your team or, or internal, it depends how you can consider that. But we are important stakeholders. There is also another stakeholder could be people from Enwrapped uh, or, or from Empathy, the people who are going to, to, to look to your projects. Another stakeholders could be the, the, the end users. Uh, other stakeholders are your yourself because the, the developers in your team. So you will have to understand uh, what are the needs that you have about the project. And you also have to understand what are the expectations, the expectations that you have about your project. Uh, and this is very important. Uh, what are the stakeholders? What what is what they want? So usually a typical format in ARC42, the typical format is a table, just a plain table where you put the name of the stakeholder, the name, the, the first name and last name or the role. Sometimes you don't identify a single person and you put a, a role. You say this is a, a, a developer or this is a business owner. Sometimes it's very good that if you identify some person or a role and you have a, a, a contact person, it's very good that you put that contact information here because later you could ask them some, I mean, what are the expectations or the needs, or you, you have to contact them frequently. That's why you have this column about the the contact information for, for those uh, stakeholders. And later you have to put the expectations. What do you think that are the expectations of those people about the, the software project that you are developing? Some in some books, so this comes from this book. This is a book that I like also, which is uh, Design It from Software Architecture. Um, they recommend to uh, create what they call a stakeholder map. A stakeholder map is that you try to put the different stakeholders in a, in a map and, and include some relationships, some basic relationships between those stakeholders. And for example, the the in this this is an, an example that comes from uh, a procurement uh, system uh, which is automated and is developing. And they say, okay, so we have developers. The developers are paid by the mayor of the city. The the council, the city council, uh, controls the manager and also controls the office of management in the. Sorry, the mayor, the mayor, and the the office of management in the in the city, and they also have this request for proposals. I don't know if you know RFP, our request for proposals in Spanish are licitaciones. So they they publish those uh, requests for proposals, those licitaciones in the official gazette. 
in Spanish is a bulletin official, and then they have the local businesses that are going to to ask for those uh, requests for proposals, and they will prepare some contracts, and they have some lawyers. So you have here this map of the different stakeholders which are involved in this system. Okay, so that's the an example of a map. So you could develop these uh, similar maps in the different projects that you develop. Um, sometimes it's interesting that uh, when you define these stakeholders, these uh, maps of stakeholders, you also try to understand what are the business goals. So the business goals, again, it's not so much about business as money, but business as the domain. So what are the uh, the 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 outcomes that they want and usually if you put those outcomes in a way that they are measurable i mean sorry for my pronunciation uh, measurable measurable uh, that's better i mean so you can later uh, measure if they are okay or not for example and this is an example of a, a business goal statement or so some business goal statement for the previous example where you say okay the mayor of the city wants to reduce cost by 30 percent so he put this number which is 30 percent and then you can later once the system has been developed I and mean, if the system has been successful you can measure and to see if the cost has been reduced have been reduced by 30 percent or not so that's a good way to measure if the is if that uh, statement has been uh, uh, successful or not okay so and you don't have to be as i say here uh, between three or five business goal statements are okay but defining these tables uh, can be very useful for at the beginning of the project to understand what you want to do okay and this is the end of this part <laughs>